And welcome back, I hope you've all been doing well. In today's video, we're gonna cover some basics about the Linux kernel and the differences between some of the distros you've either seen, heard about, or may have used. Now I want to add a disclaimer here. If you are someone who is compiling your own kernel or is an advanced user of Linux, this video isn't likely gonna be very helpful to you. Uh, this video is more of an entry level, dipping your toe in the pool, so to speak, a guide for those who are brand new to Linux and maybe even think the word kernel refers to an old white haired man selling fried chicken. But with that said, you are, of course, more than welcome to watch and offer insight, expertise, and tips in the comments below uh, that will hopefully help out uh, some of the newer users. Okay, so to break down the video, we're going to cover a very brief history of the Linux kernel, what it is exactly, how it works, and then we're going to discuss the differences between some of the more popular distros out there, such as Mint, Fedora, Pop, Ubuntu, and Arch, and so on. Now, while we're only touching on a handful of distros in that review, Keep in mind that the principles are applicable to pretty much all the distros out there, which there are a lot to say the least. And that is to say that the differences we discussed today between some of the distros we talk about are pretty much applicable to all the distros out there. So this shouldn't be a very long video, uh, but I hope it's helpful in some way. If you're new to Linux or curious about Linux, I hope this helps you clarify a little bit about what the Linux kernel is. And hopefully you'll walk away with an understanding on why it's so very important and a very popular point of discussion amongst the community. Not to mention that without it, we wouldn't have Linux at all. All right, so without further ado, uh, thank you for watching and let's just go ahead and jump into it. All right, so in the first part of this video, I want to take a few moments and talk about the Linux kernel and where it came from. The short story is that the Linux kernel was created in 1991 as a personal project of a computer science student named Linus Torvalds, a resident of Finland, I might add. And in fact, Linus was born in Helsinki in 1969 and is believed to be named after the Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling. He began attending the University of Helsinki in 1988, and his time at the university was briefly interrupted by a requirement to serve in the country's military. I believe he did 11 months in the Finnish Navy. When he completed his service, he returned to university in 1990 and eventually graduated in 1996 with a master's degree in computer science. So the birth of Linux resulted from a couple of factors and events. For one, in 1991, Linus got his hands on a PC with a 386 processor that came with MS-DOS. He wasn't particularly happy with MS-DOS, believing that it didn't take full advantage of the hardware in the PC. So he considered using Unix, but unfortunately a copy of it could not be found for less than about 5,000 US dollars at the time. He then tried Minix, which is essentially or was essentially a clone of Unix. According to the unauthorized biography about Linus on the Linux Information Project page, he wasn't thrilled that the source code for Minix was closed source and that the use of the operating system required a licensing fee. So fortunately for all of us, Linus decided to build his own operating system leading to what we have now today known as Linux, or GNU Linux if you're an absolute purist, but that in itself is a topic for another video. The first version of the Linux kernel, version 0.01, .01, was released in September 1991 by Linus onto the internet. He also included the source code with his upload, so others could continue working on it. A fun fact is that he included a small audio file demonstrating to the reader how Linux was to be pronounced. Hello, this is Linus Torvalds, and I pronounce Linux as Linux. All this obviously set the stage for the community involvement that we still see today. A quick fun fact and a digression about Linus is that he has an asteroid named after him, asteroid 9793 Torvalds. So fast forward to today, and the Linux kernel is maintained by the Linux kernel organization, which is managed by the Linux Foundation. And if you look at the board of directors for the Linux Foundation, you can see that it consists of representatives of several large companies and financial interests. So there you have it, a very brief background of Linux and of Linus himself. I do want to mention one more thing before we move on to the next section, which is that Linux almost wasn't called Linux. And in fact, Linus wanted to call it Freeax or Freeox. I can't pronounce it. But Ari Lemke, a volunteer with the project, named the folder containing the files Linux as a play on Linus's name. And it stuck. Oh, and one more fun fact. Tux, the penguin mascot for Linux, was created by Larry Ewing, a Texas A&M student, in 1996. Linus had a soft spot for penguins and was apparently bitten by one at a zoo in Australia. Of course, leave it to Australia to have attack penguins. All right, I've rambled on long enough, so let's move on to the next section. Okay, so what exactly is the Linux kernel? First, I think it's important to understand what an operating system is and what it does. Essentially, an operating system is a collection of software, which includes the kernel, that allows you, the user, to interact with your computer's hardware and software. It serves as a sort of go-between of sorts between the applications that you want to use and the overall system. There are several components that make up an operating system, 
components like the file network security management and of course user interface. There are obviously others too, but those are just the four that I could think of off the top of my head. So where does the kernel come into play here? Well, the kernel is essentially the main intermediary between the computer's hardware and its processes. The main processes in question here are memory and process management, device drivers, and system calls and security. So let's take a moment to go to Red Hat's website and take a look at how they define these processes. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the website. Memory management is to keep track of how much memory is used to store what and where. Process management determines which processes can use the CPU, when and for how long. Device drivers act as a mediator interpreter between the hardware and processes. And system calls and security receive requests for service from the processes. So we'll go ahead and close that out. I wanted to put together an analogy to, uh, to more or less help some of you that are more non-technical to understand the Linux kernel and its role in the distro that you're currently using or thinking about using. So after hours of scrubbing the web trying to find an analogy that hasn't been done to death already, uh, like the tried and true car engine analogy, I ran across one website, alift.com, that I think describes it best. So you can think of the kernel functioning like a waiter in a restaurant. So let's say that you go to your favorite place and you take a table and you want to place an order. Well, you can't just talk to the chef directly, so you need an intermediary. That intermediary is the waiter. The waiter will approach you, you place your order, and the waiter takes that order to the chef. And the chef, by the way, has total control over the stove, the microwave, the sinks, and all the hardware that he can use to process your request. The waiter tells the chef how the order needs to be prepared, essentially what needs to be done, and how it needs to be completed. The chef, controlling the stove and all the hardware in the kitchen, will make your favorite dish and carry out your request to the specifications that you want. Once the chef has completed the order, the waiter then brings it to you. Another way to think about it is, let's say that you want to play your favorite Steam game. You need an intermediary that allows the game software to interact with the computer hardware like the GPU, RAM, and motherboard. Without that intermediary, you can't play your game. So I hope this analogy makes it a bit more clear in helping you understand the role the kernel plays in the operating system. Again, this video is meant to be very entry level friendly, so there's obviously a lot more detail that we haven't touched on here. Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to the next section of this video, which is the final section. All right, so we're in the final section of the video, and we'll take a quick look at Linux distros, what a distro is, and what makes them different. So what makes a distro? A distro is essentially just an operating system, obviously different than Windows and Mac OS, but an operating system nonetheless. So we'll take a moment here to cover some of the components that make up a distro. Uh, first, we have the kernel, which we've already discussed in previous sections of this video, so we're not going to revisit it here. But we also have a package manager, which is essential for installing and updating and managing all the applications that you use. Another component is the user interface, or what we refer to as the desktop environment. And there are several options. There's GNOME, KDE, Cinnamon, XFCE, and many, many others. The desktop environment is what allows you to navigate your operating system in a way to put it simply. We also have configuration tools, which are utilities for configuring the system settings, managing hardware, and customizing your user environment. And we have system libraries and utilities, essential libraries and utilities that provide fundamental functionalities for the systems and applications. Finally, we have the software applications that you use. So what makes the Linux distros different from each other? There are quite a few variables that make the Linux distros different from each other, but some of the more superficial differences are the type of package manager they use. For example, Pop! OS uses the advanced package, uh, excuse me, the advanced package tool, which is ATP, while distros like Arch use Pac-Man. They also differ in the pre-installed software applications that come with each distro. And some distros have changes made to the kernel itself by the distro managers. Some distros use different system initialization processes, what we call sysinit, I-N-I-T. System D, which is used by Pop! OS, and there are others like OpenRC, which is used by Gentoo. So you can see there are a lot of variables in place that really define each distro, which are all unique in their own ways, technical specifications notwithstanding. So what's the best distro for you? That's a difficult question to answer, and not really one that I want to venture to offer a suggestion. I think your best course of action would be to install a hypervisor and install and play around with as many distros as you like to find the one that best suits your needs and wants. All right, so that wraps up this video. I hope that you found it helpful. I hope you got something from it. There's not much more to say, so I'll go ahead and wrap it up now by saying thank you for watching. If you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing as it helps me reach the goal of 1,000 subscribers I've set for myself by next year. And with that, 
Until the next video, stay safe and have a good one.